everybody it's my turn to read to you again today um i'm not going to read a picture book today i'm going to read a novel which me and oliver have been reading and i thought that you would really like it the novel that i'm going to read to you is called kick and it's by somebody called mitch johnson um this is all about a little boy called buddy who's really good at football and he thinks that he's going to play for the greatest team on earth at the minute, he works in a factory making football boots because he was one day he loved to wear these football boots. But one day, he has an unlucky kick and his world comes crashing down. Now, he owes somebody called the Dragon and he gets into a very sticky situation. Okay, I hope you do enjoy the story. Two minutes left on the clock. The crowd watched their hands clasped on top of their heads. Scarves hang loosely around their necks. Some of them puff their cheeks out. It's now or never. The ball is chipped in from midfield and finds him on the edge of the box. He takes it down on his chest and sidesteps the incoming defender. He pulls his foot back and takes a shot, but dummies instead, cutting inside the next tackle. The crowd rise to their feet as he surges into the box. The defenders slide to try and stop his shot, but his touch has taken the ball beyond their reach. The goalkeeper steps forward, arms stretch wide, eyes are fixed on the ball. The crowd watch through their fingers. Then he shoots. The ball fires past the goalkeeper's fingers, but for a split second, perhaps, it looks as though it might go over the crossbar. The crowd grasp, and then, as the ball hits the back of the net, they erupt. Real Madrid are the new champions. I run off to celebrate and slide on my knees. The little stones on the ground scrape against my skin and as I get up, I feel blood trickling down my leg. I rattle the rusty, rusty corrugated fence so it sounds like thousands of fans jumping and cheering in the stands. The crumbling apartment blocks rise up like a stadium on every side and I roar loud enough for even the deaf old men on the fifth floor to hear. I put my fingers and thumbs together to make the shape of a heart and pan my chest where the Real Madrid badge should be. The Indonesian wonder kid strikes again. The heart shape in my, is my trademark celebration. Whenever Ustin scores, he crosses his chest and points to the sky, even though he's supposed to be Muslim. We keep telling him that Allah will be angry if he makes a sign of the cross, but Usain says it doesn't matter because he's only pretending. I still don't think it's worth the risk. Rochi comes over and puts his arm around my shoulders. What a goal, buddy! Left them for dead! I look across the square at Usain and the doo-doo, lying on the ground. The warm evening air is thick and dust from their sliding tackles and it smells like money. The square isn't technically a square, it's a quadrilateral quadrangle and I know this because Rochi told me and Rochi is a genius. He went to school until he was 13 so he pretty no much knows everything although a lot of what, it, of what it is is useless stuff like quadrilateral quadrangles, ancient history and something called physics. He told me he recently that the universe is expanding, but I don't really understand what that means. He's tried to explain it, but I'm not a scientific genius like him. I'm a footballing genius like Kieran Wakefield, and one day I'm going to be a world famous footballer like him too. So normally I just nod and say cool, and ask Rochi to tell me something interesting about football instead. Fakri, the goalkeeper, leans against the corrugated fence we used as a goal, pulling a piece of plastic cotton from the football. Fakri has to go in goal because he's Catholic. A Catholic is just a type of Christian. There's more than one. They all support the same God, who is an Allah, but still don't agree. It's like Manchester United and Manchester City. They don't agree on anything other than being from Manchester. Fakri doesn't like going in goal because it's four Muslims against one Catholic. Rochi says that's democracy, and you can't argue with democracy. Behind the fence is where the bins are kept. On one of the balconies above the bins, a scrawny man watches us with his feet resting in a group 
where the wall has crumbled away. The soles of his feet are black. He chews his nails and spits them over the wall. The smell of fried vegetables and spices wafts across the pitch. The clank of the pots and the pans reaches us from three sides of the square, but the far end is eerily quiet. This is where the dragon lives. Some people think the dragon is called the dragon because he comes from Komodo, which is true, but it's not the reason. Komodo is where they used to send all the criminals, but everyone who comes from there is descendant from a convict. This explains a lot, but it isn't the reason why the dragon is called the dragon. Other people think that the dragon is called the dragon because he looks like one. They say he got the nickname because of his big stomach and the jeweled rings he wears on his on every finger and the thick gold chains around his neck. In fact, he was called the dragon before those things. His big belly and rings and chains are because he's rich. Mega rich. Like a footballer. He's the main landlord and money lender for the area. So everyone owes a dragon something. And if you don't, it's probably because you have just paid him. The real reason why the dragon got his nickname has got nothing to do with where he's from or how he looks. The dragon is called the dragon because if you cross him or betray him or badmouth him, he'll chew you up and spit out your bones. And he won't be bothered burying what's left of you either. As the dust settles, it sticks to the sweat on my skin. Midodo is up on his feet, brushing the dirt from his shorts. When he offers to help his brother up, Ooston slaps his hand away. Come on, Ooston, Archie says. Don't be a sore loser. I want a rematch, Ooston says, sitting up and hanging his head between his knees. It's too late now. What she says, I have to get home. What about Golden Goal? Forget it, Ooston, I say. You only have Golden Goal if teams draw and we beat you. Shut up, buddy. That goal was a fluke. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. I bet if we play another match, you won't score any. How about we play one-on-one -on -one Barcelona versus Real Madrid? Fafri can stay in goal and Rochi can run home to his mummy. What about me? Rododo asks. You can referee, Houston says. Rododo frowns and starts dusting his shorts again. You'd expect Houston to be a better loser by now. Me and Rochi have given him plenty of practice. But I suppose anyone who thinks that Barcelona are better than Real Madrid must have a lot of problems. I really want to stay and beat him but I know I shouldn't be late home for dinner. Buddy, Rochi shouts suddenly, your leg! I look down just as the trail of blood reaches my ankle. The drop spills over the plastic tongue of my boot and seeps into the laces. It's the most impressive injury I've ever had. Whoa, that's a nasty one, Rochi says. You should go home and get that cleaned up. The others gather round and admire the cut in my knee. When I bend my leg, it feels sore and a fresh dribble of blood seeps out. Yeah, you should go home, Fafri says. I pick up my football and start hobbling home. It doesn't really hurt that much, but you've got to make the most of it. That's what footballers do. Above my head, washing lines droop between the buildings and the clothes bleached by the summer sun are like Madrid flags, like we've won, won La Liga. This, like, like this is the homecoming. My chest fills with pride and I pat my t-shirt where the Real Madrid badge should be. I'll play you one-on-one -on -one tomorrow night, Ooston, I call over my shoulder, breaking into a stiff jog. Barca are going down. There's no place like home. What on earth have you done to your leg, buddy? Mum is always worrying. Worrying about grandma, worrying about money, worrying about me. I'm always telling her that she shouldn't worry so much because it's bad for her health. But then she just worries about worrying. She gets especially worried whenever I cut myself because I've got this condition 
where you don't stop bleeding. There's something wrong with my blood, which means it doesn't clot properly. Instances, it's because my family don't pray or fast like proper Muslims, so Allah has cursed us. My grandpa had it, my dad and his twin brother had it too, so it's kind of like a family curse. But we don't talk about my uncle. Not since he took what a one-way trip to Execution Island. What Ustin doesn't realise is that having a bleeding problem makes you the best at dodging tackles. So it's actually a blessing. It's okay, I say. It's just a graze. But there's blood everywhere. I look down and realise it looks a lot worse since I ran home. The blood has trickled around my shin and there are spots of it all over my boots. How did it happen? I got attacked by a tiger. Oh, really? She crosses her arm, creasing the orange fabric of her shirt. And what was the tiger doing in the middle of Jakarta? It must have swum all the way here from Sumatra. Rochi says that Sumatran tigers are really good swimmers because they've got webbed paws. Is that right, Mum asks? It must have been hungry to swim all that way. Very hungry. So, why did it take such a small bite? It ate Ustin first. Mum laughed, and I smiled because all the worry disappears from her face. But then she looks very serious. I hope Ustin isn't responsible for what happened to your leg. I hope you boys are playing nicely. Doesn't Rochi look after you? That's the trouble with being small for your age. Everyone thinks you need a bodyguard. Everyone, especially when you have a bleeding problem. I don't need looking after mum. I'm almost 12. Anyway, you should have seen the goal that I scored. She ruffles my hair. You can tell me all about it over dinner. But first, you need to clean your leg before dad gets home. Wait on the step and I'll bring you a cloth and some water. Sitting in the doorway with my legs stretched out into the street, I pick at the crusty blood on the front of my shin. I dig out a small chunk of glass from the skin beneath my knee and flick it across the road. It lands among some rubbish in the doorway of the crumbling apartment blocks opposite. The block has been on the verge of collapsing for as long as I can remember. The walls have wide cracks cracks sprouting from the floor and the whole thing seems to lean towards the building next to it. Dad says he used the wrong type of concrete and the government has banned everyone from living there. But the dragon still rents it out. Mum brings a cloth and water and puts them down next to me. The printed flowers on the hem of her cane squish across the ground and she makes a dust smell like flowers too. Make sure you wash all the grit out. If it gets infected, I don't know how we'll pay for medication. Mum goes back into the apartment and I start washing the spots of blood from my boots because I don't want them to get stained. Mum and Dad bought them for my birthday last year and I've finally grown into them. They're fakes, obviously, but they're good fakes, real fakes. I know they must have been expensive and the last thing I want is to have blood-stained football boots. You never see a professional footballer in bloodstained boots, do you? After I finish cleaning my boots, I start scrubbing at my shin. The blood comes off pretty easily, and by the time Dad arrives, I've washed all the little bits of grit out of the cut. Dad works in a factory that makes smart shirts for businessmen, and even though he doesn't have to, he always wears a short sleeve shirt with a collar to work. Either his white one, or the one with yellow and blue checks. He says it's very important to be proud of yourself. He's always telling me that. Buddy, if you don't respect yourself, nobody will. You must be proud of who you are. Today he is wearing a shirt with yellow and blue checks and it sticks to a sweaty patch on his chest. As he gets closer, he smiles and sits down on the step beside me. What happened then? here then? He asks, kissing me on the head. I cut my leg playing football. Dad leans over and grimaces as I show him my knee. The cut glistens with fresh blood. Make sure you get all the grit out. You don't want it to get infected. 
I nod and keep brushing it with the cloth. Was it a foul? Dad asks. No, but I scored an amazing goal, so it was worth it. Good boy. If you keep it up, you'll play for Madrid one day. Real Madrid, Dad. If you just say Madrid, it could mean Atletico Madrid. And I would, ra- n- I would rather never play football again than play for them. I know, I know. I meant Real Madrid. Just keep practising and we'll get there. I smile and Dad pats me on the back. It's already dark, but the air is still very warm. Dad looks up at the small patches of sky among the laundry. It's going to rain soon, he says. The monsoon must be on its way. Can you feel it? Yeah, I say. But at that moment, it's hard to imagine bone dry streets thick with mud, rainwater dripping from the empty washing line and people splashing through puddles with newspapers held above their heads. Sometimes it feels like the dry season will never end, that the days will just get hotter and hotter forever. But it's got to rain soon. The air has become sticky and heavy waiting for it. But tonight, there are no clouds. Just a black, starless sky. So the weather won't break yet. The sound of people chattering over dinner reaches us from the apartments above. Every so often, a scooter blares past kicking up dust that turns red in the glow of the brake lights. A fresh trickle of blood dribbles down my shin. Here, Dad says, taking a handkerchief from his pocket and twisting it. Hold this against your knee while I knot it. He ties the bandage tight. How's that? Much better. My stomach crumbles and he smiles. Come on, let's go and see if dinner's ready. Mum is just spooning the rice onto steel trays when we walk in and I help her carry them from the kitchen in one corner to the table in the other. Grandma is already waiting with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. Hello Grandma, I say. Aren't you going to be hot in that blanket? You know Mum's made spicy rendang tonight. Mum hasn't really made spicy rendang because today is Wednesday. On Wednesday... We just have rice. Wednesdays are better than Fridays because we don't have anything on a Friday. But I like to imagine there's a feast on the rickety little table and Grandma plays along. Today is a tray of Mum's world famous rendang. I'm just fine, thank you, Grandma says. An old woman like me needs to keep warm and I haven't tasted rendang that has been too spicy for me yet. When Grandma smiles, her wrinkly face creases even more, and her eyes become narrow slits. Grandma isn't like other old ladies, because most of them get really thin and bony the older they get. But Grandma still has plump, round cheeks. She puts this down to maintaining a healthy appetite, which is almost as important as being proud of who you are and pursuing your dreams. Grandma is full of useful advice. Once a snake... Grandma is full of useful advice and interesting stories. Once a snake bit her on the arm and she sucked the venom out. Now she is immune to venom. Another time she fell from a third story window that landed in a passing cart carrying silks and soft fabrics. It's because of this and the fact that she's the oldest person I know that I'm beginning to think Grandma might be indestructible. Your mother was just telling me that you cut your leg today. I hope you washed it properly. Yes, Grandma, I got all the grit out. And I suppose I'd never be able to guess how you hurt yourself. Playing football. Football. Always football. Football will be the death of you, young man. Grandma smiles at me. And for a moment... I think she's going to come clean about being indestructible. But then she looks down at her tray and takes a big mouthful of rice. I know she's joking about football being the death of me because being a footballer is probably the safest job in the world. When a footballer gets injured, there are about six doctors around him in a second, even if he's just pretending. Once I waited almost six hours to see a doctor at the hospital when mum thought I was bleeding on the inside and even then I didn't get put on a stretcher and carried out like a prince. Bleeding on the inside is the worst. 
Most people think having a bleeding problem means you're going to bleed to death from the time you succumb. But the real problem is bleeding on the inside. At any moment, I might start bleeding and not know until I fall over and die. You can't see it. You can't taste it. Some people can't even feel it. But I think I can. It's that feeling of when you've done something bad and grandma or Roger find out and there's a knife in you somewhere, near your heart. And with every word they say, it turns a little further, pushing in a little deeper. Bleeding on the inside is definitely the worst. Mum turns to Dad and says, how was work today? Elvis. That's another thing about Grandma. She gave Dad a crazy name. Elvis Presley was an American singer and a movie star about 60 years ago. And Grandma was madly in love with him until he died on the toilet. I suppose it's hard to love someone after that. But while he was still alive, Dad was born and Grandma called him Elvis. I'm not sure how Grandpa felt about the whole situation. I would ask him, but I can't because he died in a big earthquake that happened when I was little. Mum says I slept through the whole thing. It suddenly hits me that I don't know what Grandma called my uncle. If she had twins and named one of them Elvis, what did she call the other? Presley? Without thinking, I interrupted Dad telling us about his date and then asked Grandma, Grandma, what name did you give to Uncle? I should have remembered this silence from the last time I mentioned Uncle in front of my family. I should have remembered the stern look on Grandma's face, the coolness in her eyes, that feeling like her hand is gripping the knife on the inside. Slowly, she turns her head to face me. Buddy, she says, you don't have an uncle. Not anymore. I swallow, even though there's nothing in my mouth. Yes, Grandma, I muttered, but I still don't understand. I mean, obviously, they called Nusa Kambanga execu Execution Island for a reason. I know what happens there. I know no one comes back. I know when you do something wrong, something bad, they take you there and lock you up in a tiny cell for years and years until you're sure everyone has forgotten about you. Then one night while you're asleep on your flea-ridden bed, they drag you out to a quiet place, kicking and screaming and confused. And they give you a choice, kneeling or standing. And then they shoot you. No matter how much you beg and cry and plead, no matter how blurry your vision gets or how much your nose runs, they aim their rifle at your head and shoot you. I, I know all that. I have nightmares about it. What I don't know is whether Uncle has been there long enough yet and my family aren't going to tell me. I stare into my tray and chew a mouthful of rice for as long as it takes for someone to break the silence. Sorry, Mum says, talking to Dad, but looking at me. You were telling us about your day, Elvis. You know how frustrating it is, Dad says. I asked the party when we were getting last month's wages, and he said it should be any day now. But I know he's too scared to confront the boss about it. I don't blame him. He knows if he makes a fuss, it will probably delay the payment even more. He might even lose his job if he upsets the wrong people. But it's annoying especially because I'm still waiting for overtime from the month before that. Mum reaches across to Dad and strokes his arm. It'll be a lot easier when minimum wage goes up, she says. If it ever goes up, Grandma says. They talk about these things all the time, but nothing seems to happen. And those people protesting in the street will only make things worse, no matter what they say. Dad takes a deep breath. And his face breaks into a smile. Now, come on, Ubu. Change is coming. Things will get easier. Besides, we'll be rich when Buddy plays for Real Madrid. Dad winks at me and Grandma shakes her head, muttering something about football. Tell us about the goal you scored today, Buddy, Mum says. I'll have to stand up to explain it properly. Don't get indigestion, Mum says. I won't. I do them in action replay. 
I show them how Rochi chipped the ball to me, how I took it down on my chest, dodged Bidoo's tackle, dummied the shot, stepped into inside Ouston and scored past Fakri. It's hard to do the goal justice in such a small space, but my family clap as I run round the table celebrating. I have to stop to squeeze between Dad's chair and the wall. But when I get through, I put my fingers and thumbs together to make the shape of a heart and pat my chest where the Real Madrid badge should be. I wish I could have seen it, Don Mai says, smiling. When I'm a professional, I'll buy you a television so you can watch me play without leaving your armchair. They all laugh, but suddenly Grandma starts coughing horribly. It sounds like rocks are being grated inside her throat and bits of rice fly from her mouth. Mum gets up and pats her on the back, but Grandma holds up her hand to make her stop. I try to ignore Grandma's coughing fit by scraping the last bit of rice into a pile. I hate looking at Grandma when she's coughing. Her eyes become all bloodshot and tears roll over her cheek. It's like she be becomes a different person, someone who is not indestructible. But after a minute or so, she always recovers and tries to pretend nothing has happened. Even though her eyes are red and watery and the squidgy vein on her forehead bulges beneath her skin. I'll watch every match you play in, she says, as mum lifts a cup of water to her lips. We finish dinner and I help mum clear the trays away. Dad gives Grandma his arm so she can get back to her armchair. I don't like watching Grandma on the move because she always looks so weak. When, when she is sitting in her big cosy armchair with a blanket across her lap, smiling at everything and telling stories about her youth, she doesn't seem that old. But when she shuffles across the room with her back hunched over, she starts to look like the old woman who roams the street. It's only a couple of metres from the, ta from the table to her chair, but she makes it seem like a marathon. That's why I'm always so keen to help with the washing up after dinner. By the time I turn round again, Grandma is tucked up in her chair. Will you tell me a story, Grandma, before I go to bed? Of course. Come and sit on the rug and I'll tell you about the time I found a ti tiger in the yard. No, Grandma. Tell me a story that I haven't heard before. Okay, let me see. Have I told you about the time it rained so hard the roof collapsed? Yes. How about the man I knew with six fingers and six toes? Yes. She scratches her neck and puts her finger to her lips. Mum and Dad sit at the table watching Grandma with smiling eyes. How about the boy I knew who wanted to be an actor? No, you've never told me that one before. What happened? Well, when I was a girl, I knew a boy who wanted desperately to be an actor. He was a few, old, few years older than me, very good looking, and all he could think about was acting. When you talked to him, you would think nothing else existed. He said he wanted to be a famous actor in the Hollywood movies. Everyone laughed at him, of course, because he worked in his father's paddy fields, didn't speak any English, and no one in the village had ever left the island, let alone been to America. But he didn't let that bother him. He used to save every rupee he could, and when he had enough, he would take the bus to the nearest town with the cinema and watch whatever was shown. He would come back full of energy and renewed ambition, determined to become a star. He could remember lines from the films and would act them out if you asked him politely. I must say, he was very good. Then he would begin saving his money to do it all over again. Grandma clasps her hands together and rests them on her lap. While she talks, I wind the tassels at the edge of the rug around my fingers. Apparently, the rug was given to Grandma as a wedding gift, so it must be ancient. The patch in front of her chair is threadbare and not as soft as the rest, but it's still my favourite place to sit. And then what happened? I ask. Well, one morning the boy's father went out into the fields to check the oxen had been rigged up for the plough for the day's work, but his son was nowhere to be seen. At first, everyone thought he'd taken an early bus to watch the film, 
and the fan was furious at his son's neg 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 negligence, but he still hadn't returned by mid-afternoon. When night came, the farmer remained adamant that his son would be back soon. He thought the boy was hiding nearby, planning to sneak back home after everyone had gone to bed to avoid being beaten. But night came and went, and gradually we came to, the real to realise that he wasn't coming back. Grandma stops to smooth the blanket across her lap. She always pauses at the worst moment. And then what happened? The village never heard of him again. At least, as far as I know, because I moved away a few years later. Everyone assumed he had been kidnapped. People went missing all the time. Back then, more so than today. But then one day, it must have been about 20 years after he went missing. I was on a bus and I went past one of those big billboards just outside the city that was advertising a new American film. I couldn't be certain because I only saw it for a few seconds before we drove by. But one of the actors looked just like an older version of the boy I knew. Well, I thought, that settles it. He did make it after all. I just hope he went back to visit his cruel father once in a while. Are you sure it was him, Grandma? Quite sure, she says, adjusting herself in her armchair. I never forget a face. What was his name? Don't ask me that. I might not forget a face, but I can certainly forget a name. Now, I can feel my eyelids drooping, and you've got an early start in the morning, so off you go to bed. I get up and kiss Grandma on the cheek. Despite how wrinkled her face is, her skin is really soft. You better let your mother take a look at that cut, Grandma says, glancing down at the ba bloody bandage around my knee. Mum gets up from the table and unties the handkerchief. It's soaked and hangs like a dead animal in her hands. It still looks quite fresh, she says. Elvis, can you pass me the coconut butter? Dad retrieves a, a tin from the kitchen cupboard and passes it to Mum. She scoops out a dollop of butter and smears it across the cup with her fingertip. The coolness of it makes my knee twitch and it's almost worth getting injured just for the sweet, delicious smell. Sometimes, when no one is looking, I eat the butter straight out of the tin to heal any cuts on the inside. There, she says, standing up and giving me a hug. That should do the trick. We'll see you in the morning, superstar, Dad says, ruffling my hair. Sleep well, son. I go to my room and get undressed. The light bulb has gone, so I have to do it in the dark. But it isn't difficult to find my mattress because it takes up most of the room. When I'm in bed, I listen to the hum of different generators until one by one they're switched off and I fall asleep to the distant sound of the city. <laughs>